See myself in my lenses. Yeah, I mean, this is a recording, so you guys can watch this later if you want to, if you're not able to join. Uh, whoever comes in now, we'll get to see what happens after this point. But I'll be uh, lecturing until 7.40. Uh, again, this is going to be for HVR 155. Uh, this is the evening lecture. Uh, this is week four, lesson one. Uh, we're going to be discussing gas heat again. Uh, unit 31 in your textbook. Uh, I think we're on page one second. It's 879. Calling correctly. So, unit 31. Um, with gas heat, what we're discussing is uh, the application as far as we're getting to energy efficient gas heating. That's what we're going to start talking about. Um, this is actually a lot easier to have the classes on. Um, I've short sighted this, so. I don't know why I haven't been doing this before. Um, excuse me. Make too much seltzer. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight is going to be a number of different things. Uh, but starting first thing, as far as energy efficient units go, is we start it with the two-stage gas burn. So 878, sorry, 879, 878 right there at that crossover. Uh, section 31.23 is where we're going to be. So that's where we're starting. Um, so we'll go ahead and start the slideshow. Um, so after studying this lesson, you're going to be able to talk about two-stage gas furnaces. What we're going to talk about, we're talking about modulating gas furnaces and variable output programmable thermostats. That stuff, super cool. Um, that's your high-end top line, brand new, super high tech kind of stuff where you're having to not just go out and make sure it's got 24 volts, but make sure uh, that it's, you know, connected to the internet, that it's updated, that it's actually working properly. Uh, this is one of the things that becomes difficult with modern smart devices is you've got it where, uh, I keep thinking, oh, you know what it is? It's this little thing, that's why I'm looking. That's weird. Um, but the, uh, uh, modern smart devices, the big challenge for a lot of technicians is adapting to the idea that we've got it where now it's no longer going to be a um, old school HVAC style system where it's just mechanical and electrical and all this kind of stuff. Now we've got a digital component to it. We've got microprocessors we're going to be, microprocessors we'll be dealing with. Um, so that's one of the big challenges with uh, modern systems as far as what we're going to be seeing a lot of days. Uh, but we'll talk about how we got to that point. First things first we talk about is a two-stage gas furnace. So two-stage gas furnaces, um, they're going to be using a two-stage gas valve. Pretty simple. Uh, I sent out a video earlier, I have a whole bunch of videos for you all. Um, 
there's one that's included in that that uh, basically explains the whole process of a two-stage gas furnace, how to uh, how it operates, how it works, um, all that kind of stuff. So you've got it where it's it's two stages, all right? You've got low speed, you got high speed. That's it. So it's either going at uh, about 50 to 60 percent heat, uh, some of them up to about 70 percent heat, um, and then 100 percent. So as opposed to most uh, single speed gas furnaces that are only gonna allow either furnace is off or the furnace is going full blast, you know, imagine if you had a cooktop burner and if you only had an option between off or on, and that was it. And not on like little tiny flames, no, 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 your flames are on high. So you go from either, either that, that's all you can switch between is either off or high heat. Uh, that really doesn't allow for you to change it according to the load. You know, if I'm, you know, that's fine if I'm boiling pots of water, I need high heat. But if I'm, you know, uh, only heating up like a thing of chili or something like that, I don't need that. Otherwise, it's going to be splashing everywhere all over the place. Or if, uh, you know, um, if you're making a roux or something like that, just oil and flour, you don't want high, high heat. Even oil, especially, you don't want high, high heat. For us, the equivalent would be, um, having it where we don't need that high high heat for let's say a day in October or a day like right now or having in March uh, or the end of March now because 31st tomorrow it's April 1st that's so weird uh, time flies when you're having fun or paranoid about coronavirus either way whatever um, so the main thing is we've got it where with the uh, with the gas heat um, you would have it where it was heating like it was the middle of winter all winter long, all fall. As long as you have the heat on, it's acting like it's the middle of winter. Um, having two-stage heat allows it so that, you know, well, it's not the middle of winter. Let it, you know, go at a little bit slower speed. Um, and it has different tools and things like that that it can use to predict and control when it goes into that first or second stage of heating. Uh, has to do with thermostats, has to do with control boards, uh, operates with uh, a number of different switches. Uh, we got a lot of different ways that we can get a two-stage gas furnace to operate uh, properly. So um, there's uh, a lot going on with these things. Uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be not just two stages for the gas valve, but two stage for your, uh, can, uh, your, So for a second, I had a major brain fart. Inducer draft motor. There we go. Uh, so you're going to have where you get a two-stage gas valve, two-stage inducer draft motor, at least a two-speed blower motor, um, and you've got to have it where you have these uh, settings put in correctly as far as what's your low pressure on the low side of this gas valve. If you have it where the pressure is set too low for the first stage, um, you know, second stage easy. You go 100% done. Uh, but for the first stage, if you have it where it's set too low of a pressure, you can have improper combustion because uh, the uh, inducer trap motor might be pulling too much air in for combustion and you're actually not having uh, good proper uh, combustion where you're getting you know reduced oxygen coming out of that flue stack. Um, for a uh, for the, um, uh, the, the the other thing is you know if you have it where it's set to uh, too high of a gas pressure for your low speed, you can actually have it where then your major problem will be uh, overheating. That's the big problem there. Uh, the other issue we can also have is if we have it where it's set to too low of a temperature or too low of a pressure, um, you can actually have, uh, you can actually have it where it'll be um, a, uh, uh, the, the blower motor kicking on will cool off that heat exchanger too quickly um, and that'll actually cause problems where it'll be uh, basically overcooled uh, for that um, uh, for that heat exchanger and everything. Um, so I'm just talking about uh, two-stage gas furnaces. Um, again, I'm going to load up this video. Uh, once we're done, I'll put it on YouTube and send it out to y'all. Um, so that way, because everyone just pretty much missed that first couple of minutes there. Um, so uh, as far as two stage, it makes sense. All right, standard 
inches of water column gas pressure coming from a uh, gas valve on a natural gas furnace, all right, that's what we're talking about here, that's what we're using as our example, is three and a half inches of water column, three to three and a half, that's in your book, it talks about that. Um, so it makes sense if we're going half the speed, we'd need half the pressure. So that half pressure, half of three and a half is 1.75 inches of water column. Uh, it's going to produce about 50 to 70 percent, depends on the manufacturer, how much. A lot of them will do 60 percent. Um, and that'll be basically its heating output is it's not going to put out all the heat that it can produce. It's just going to put out some of the heat it can produce. Uh, this makes it so that it's consuming less fuel. So therefore, by consuming less fuel, uh, it's going to be costing you less on your energy bill uh, at the end of the month and everything like that. So that's that's the nice thing about this. You know, when you have those milder months, having a two-stage gas furnace allows for um, your uh, heating equipment to operate at a lower speed uh, and consume gas at a lower rate. Um, it, it, it fluctuates, basically. Um, but, you know, still going to cost you a pretty penny if it gets cold, 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 because it'll go full speed and it'll do what it needs to do. And that's the second stage. The first stage, we're talking about, you know, 50 to 70 percent. Uh, about 1.75 inches of water column. Again, depends on the manufacturer. They'll have different ratings for them. Most of them, as far as what the first stage or the second stage is, um, that will be from the manufacturer. That's going to be a rating uh, that they'll they'll come out with their unit. The other thing that they'll have is um, they'll have a uh, uh, a rating for these modulating ones. They'll talk about basically instead of First stage, second stage, we'll talk about min-max, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, um, but again, if it's going second stage, that basically means full speed. That's that's what second stage is. It's not like we've got like six gears to go through or, you know, um, anything like that. It's with a two-stage gas furnace, makes sense. First stage, second stage, there is no third. Uh, so the first stage is half speed, second stage, full-on 100% heat uh, production. So the other thing we've got now, this is your more common system you're going to see nowadays. Uh, Two-stage gas furnaces were very popular in uh, the 90s and uh, the 80s, um, and they kept around the early 2000s as well. Uh, but right about the early 2000s dot-com era, uh, control boards and computer parts and components were becoming more mainstream and more accessible. Um, they were becoming... Uh, you know, something that was used in everyday life. Uh, back then, that was the high end of high end. I'm talking, you were a commercial or industrial business, and you could afford to get modulating uh, heating equipment. You could get it where you've got a, um, so we talked about it before, you have it where uh, two speed, it's got it where it's a percentage. So 50% is the first speed, 100% is the second speed. For the modulating gas furnace, it's got the same percentages, zero to 100. The nice thing about it is it can go 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. It's every little amount. Now, I'm not going to say that every single one of them have 100 speeds or 100 alterations as far as uh, pressures and um, uh, uh, heat production value and everything like that, how many BTUs they're going to put out per hour. Um, but the... Uh, the big adjustment is it, it's it's almost like that. You know, they might not be 100 speed, but they're probably gonna be like 50 speeds. And that's insane, you know? Uh, it used to be a big deal when an inducer draft motor and a blower motor both had two speeds on a two-stage furnace. Uh, nowadays, it's, you no, know, we have modulating controls that use DC electricity and can control and allow for um, just incremental amounts of speed and power to pick up over time for that system. Uh, so it's, um, these are what you're gonna see. I mean, this is, you guys go out there, y'all are out in the field. Uh, when it comes to new equipment now in 2020, pretty much everything's gonna be modulating. At least, at least one component on just about every unit is starting to be modulating. Usually starts with the blower motor. Um, because it's the cheaper one, uh, because it's the most accessible, and because it's the one that touches the most equipment. 
Uh, the blower motor is moving airflow for your air conditioning and for your heating. Uh, your, if you did a modulating uh, compressor or condenser fan motor, those would be restricted to only helping out with your cooling. Uh, same with a modulating inducer draft motor, which is what these gas furnaces have. Um, that's restricted to only helping during the heating season. Uh, so it's, um, it's one of those things that you're gonna see more and more, it's, it's, it's just becoming common because it's so freaking energy efficient. I mean, you have it where you can just incrementally increase the amount of heat that you need to produce. Um, and there's ones that it, they will, I mean, they will have a microprocessor at the thermostat, at the furnace, and they'll have a microprocessor at the outdoor condenser unit. And all three of those processors will be feeding back information to each other in, in, in digital code and in, in, uh, zeros and ones uh, in binary. Um, and they will feed that information back to one main board. And that board will take that information and will crank up the heat or slow it down depending on what's the load. So the whole idea behind this is, you know, with the outdoor unit especially, Outside, we'll have temperature sensors and, uh, you know, uh, humidity, sen humid humidity uh, sensors uh, outside that can see, okay, what's the outdoor temperature, what's the outdoor humidity, uh, feed that information back to the board, back to the indoor unit, back to that furnace, and then tell that furnace, hey, you know what, today's only 50 degrees with like 60% humidity, so we're really not needing a ton of heat, um, you know, and then they've got other ones where, um, you know, it might not even need an outdoor temperature sensor. It might just, well, just hook it up to the Wi-Fi, put on AccuWeather, and let's see the seven-day forecast and get ready seven days ahead of time to adjust how much heat it needs to produce just because it knows what's coming. And the other thing with these, when they have memory for them, it'll build memory and it will learn, uh, you know, if it's got a house that might be a little draftier than what it was originally you know, designed for, um, it will adjust itself for that. Uh, now that's when you're getting the really high end stuff, but that's what you're seeing in most residences nowadays is uh, you spend a pretty penny on a gas furnace or on a good air conditioner system, and you will have it where it's gonna have a lot of communication, a lot of controls. Uh, it's getting to be, you know, no longer is this space age technology, it's computer science, you know, information era, uh, information wave. Uh, it's It's, it's intense, um, but at the end of the day, am I troubleshooting a microprocessor and a control board? No, no. I'm checking voltages and amperages and making sure that uh, power is getting to my components and everything like that. So, you know, if for some reason I, I'm getting power into a board, but it's not coming out of one and the microprocessor is the reason why, I don't care that it's a microprocessor. I care that the board's not sending power, you know, and I'm going to look for obvious damage to the board or something like that is an easy way to test it. But, uh, you know, you're at a, at, a, at a certain point, you might have to call a manufacturer and be like, hey, look, this is what I've got going on uh, for this style of system. When you're dealing with one of their really nice systems, one of these new high-end ones, they're more willing to help you out because they're new, they're high-end. They might not have heard of your problem before and they wanna have more information. The more information that they gather uh, as uh, a manufacturer on faults and errors in their system can make it so that future customers, uh, future models, uh, future designs and everything like that can take those things into account. If they have a constant problem where, you know, they get calls every single day about the same, you know, error code or the same communication issue, um, it makes it so that they know what's going on quicker. I had it where uh, that happened to me with Carrier. I had a, a communication error between an indoor and an outdoor unit. I could not figure out what was going on with it. I'd reset the power, the communication error would go away, and then I'd walk away from it, and a week later, it would come right back. And I called the Carrier finally, and they were the ones that told me, well, oh yeah, this has been a problem we've been having, and this is the issue we found what it is. You need to replace some wiring between your indoor and outdoor unit. I was like, oh, is that all it really is? And I'm like, yeah, that's all you really need to do. Um, and, but it was because they were like, they told me, you know, hey, we've had this happen before. This has been a recurring issue with these new infinity systems. Um, so it was, uh, it was something that was really a, a nice relief. So always, always, always feel free to contact your manufacturer when it comes to uh, errors, when, especially with boards, uh, because they can be so tricky. 
And the last thing you want is a board that's under warranty. Uh, and uh, you have to, you know, you think it's wrong, you replace it. Uh, the system fires up for some reason, uh, probably because it's a new board and it's got new power uh, supplied to it and everything where you tighten one wire down a little bit tighter than it was on the previous board, but you didn't notice. And uh, that might have all the other boards might have needed. It's a tightened wire. Because that a lot of these boards, especially nowadays, are getting to the point where uh, they'll have inch pounds of force that you have to have each screw head torqued down to. And if it's not torqued down to that, then it's void of warranty. Um, and, and if it's not, and if you haven't checked those torques, then you didn't do a thorough enough job, uh, which is kind of annoying. But it's it's what they do with these really high end ones because. Uh, this is not a control board that sets you back, you know, $150, $200. This is a control board that sets you back $1,500. Uh, so it's very, very expensive. Uh, they take up about, you know, I'd say at least two to three times the space physically uh, of your standard control boards. So it's, um, they're pretty intense. Um, but they've got a lot of uh, things that are going on with them. A lot of information that's being fed into it. A lot of information that's putting back out into the system. Um, but it makes it so that you can have, uh, you know, all this level of control where um, you've got it where it can go from zero to 100 and it can take one step at a time to build up that speed, um, you know, and to build up that heat level. Uh, again, these are going to be uh, basically for gas pressures. Uh, instead of for this two stage, you're looking at a, a low stage and high stage for your gas pressure and seeing, okay, what is the gas pressure at the low side? What's the gas pressure on the high side? Uh, these gas furnaces will have it where it's gonna be set as a minimum and a maximum gas pressure. Uh, typically, it's gonna be controlled uh, by a set of dip switches on the board as far as uh, when you get to the testing uh, component of this and when you start actually um, uh, basically adjusting the settings for that gas pressure, uh, that's when you're gonna see uh, that um, that minimum, that maximum, when you're gonna have to use those dip switches. Uh, those will typically be labeled and information will be given to you. You can either find it on the unit or on the World Wide Web. Uh, a lot of these new modulating gas furnaces, they've got QR codes that'll be on them that you can scan, uh, or they'll have, um, you know, uh, uh, um, a good uh, emergency line or a helpline kind of thing for technicians. Uh, you can have it where you can look up online and try to find the install guide is one of the easiest things to do. You find the install guide or the uh, uh, the maintenance guide for an air conditioning or well for a furnace especially uh, for a gas furnace and that's going to give you basically everything the manufacturer wants done with that unit uh, as far from from the beginning from the get-go uh, and for troubleshooting it's usually a section that's included in that so it's not just going to be um, you know, uh, uh, how to install the unit, but also how to troubleshoot it if you have an issue. Because they, they include that information in case when you install the unit, it doesn't fire up right away. And you have to do some troubleshooting, which can happen, especially with these new modulating systems. Um, because they're a little bit funky, because they're a little bit weird, uh, they require uh, a little more, um, you know, tender love and care. Uh, and a little more watching over than your old school gas furnaces that just, yeah, it wasn't that efficient and sure it ate up a lot of the energy bill, but man, it just stayed there for 35 years and didn't need anything. And now, you know, customers aren't being told, but when you get these new systems, you're going to need, you're inheriting more maintenance. You're inheriting more things to go wrong on the system, more parts. Uh, so getting a standard uh, you know, um, maintenance checkup and uh, um, uh, furnace, uh, at, at least a furnace if they've got the furnace that's modulating, uh, you know, just a, a quick checkup and, and make sure that everything's working properly because the last thing you want is, you know, something to start going bad and you not notice it until winter time hits and then you've got a guy that's rushing out there to try and figure it out. And it's one of these new furnaces that needs a crazy weird part that, um, they're not going to be able to get until the morning and it's, you know, 20 degrees outside and it's two and two in the morning. And you're like, are you kidding me? I've got to wait how many hours until you can come back out? Well, it's going to be like six or seven until at least the store opens. Then if I get there and then got the part in stock, it'll be another hour and a half before I can get back out here. 
and then they're, you know, thinking, what am I going to do for that amount of time? Like, I can't live without my heat that long. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, but that's something that a lot of people aren't being uh, informed about is that you have it where uh, more and more of uh, these new high-end efficiency systems also are requiring more maintenance. Uh, so it kind of cuts into the cost of it, but I mean, the energy efficiency is so worth it. It's not, not even a thing. Um, so uh, again, this will be adjusting inducer draft motor speed. It'll be adjusting the amount of gas coming out of the gas out, and it's gonna adjust that blower motor speed all according to how much gas are we burning at this point, how much heat are we producing, how much air are we needing to move and flow and go out into our various spaces. Um, the nice thing with a lot of these is when they get combined with a uh, zone controlled uh, duct system, that is becoming more common uh, for uh, heating large residences, like I'm talking like, uh, you know, 2,500, 3,000 square foot homes um, where they have, uh, you know, two stories and they've got a whole big open basement. Um, instead of having it where back in the day you would put a gas furnace in the basement, a small one for the first floor and this, for the first floor and for the basement, that's all that gas furnace would heat. And then you slap a heat pump into the attic uh, that heats up the upstairs, that second story. Uh, nowadays, it's let's just put a giant. And I mean giant. I've been in residences where it's got like an eight burner gas furnace. Um, and so it's a massive gas furnace. But you put that big one in the basement and then you have it where it's connected the ductwork on the basement, the first floor and the second floor with dampers and controls to open and close ductwork and allow for air to flow to different areas. Uh, and you'll have temperature sensors or thermistors in those areas that'll all let that heat flow where it needs to. Um, and that's a really cool thing with the modulating furnaces because you know you get your first room and it starts calling for heating. Well, it starts turning on at like, you know, 10% of its you know need. Well, the second room calls for heat as well. Well, let's put it to 25%. Third room calls, let's put it to 40%. Fifth room calls, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, let's go to 80%. You get the whole house calling for heat. All right, 100%. But it was allowing itself to build up to that speed that's going to save the energy. Um, and the other thing is, usually with that, it's going to not go up to that 100%. It'll just kind of fluctuate up to about 60 and then back down to zero. Uh, because as one room is heated, it'll close off the damper, another room will open a damper because it needs to be heated, and it'll just basically open and close until it's gotten everything heated nice and evenly. So you don't have uh, wasted heat. You don't have it where you've got uh, overheating in different zones or different rooms, um, and you've got it where there's a lot more control over your energy, your comfort, and uh, the um, operation uh, and effectiveness of that gas furnace. So uh, again, optimizing to get uh, the furnace performance is the whole thing behind it, uh, utilizing variable speed blower motors, inducer draft motors, and gas valves. Um, so the only other thing that we'll talk about tonight is a variable output programmable thermostat. Um, these are the ones I was saying before. You can put a seven-day forecast on the thermostat. It will adjust and already know ahead of time, oh, I need to be into heating. Oh, I need to be into cooling. Oh, I need to be dehumidifying. I need to go into a uh, high heat with high humidity added to it or something. like. I mean, it really will make that level of adjustment. It just depends on the sophistication of the device. Uh, the cost of it is one of the big factors on how sophisticated it's going to be. Um, I mean, I've had them where it's been a little tiny, you know, block. It looks like a, a fancy graphing calculator when you start operating on it and you have all these numbers and codes and it'll log back and say, you know, okay, well, four days ago, the furnace went out on, you know, a high pressure error and three days ago it went out on a high pressure error and two days ago it went out on a you know, uh, a high temperature error or something like that. And they'll tell me every single error for that system that it's logged uh, as far as faults um, and uh, uh, misfires and everything like that. It'll let me know when we had, when that issue has gone on. So I don't have to hope that the customer knows, you know, hey, do you know what it sounds like when your furnace is off or when it's not operating properly? 
that's typically no they don't because i'm the same way i mean if i would if i didn't do hvac shoot i wouldn't know how what a furnace is supposed to sound like i'm not paying attention to that thing i only notice when it stops working that that's the truth of the matter for pretty much every single customer out there uh residentially at least that's what you're going to see now commercial customers they're a little more sensitive about it they're going to pay attention to their hvac unit because they see it as a major money hog. They see it as something that just eats up their profits is, okay, how much do I, how long is this HVAC system got to operate? How long, how much is it going to cost while it's operating? And then if I got to get someone out here, how much is that going to cost to get me a guy out, you know, to give me someone out here who's going to fix this thing? Um, that's where it becomes difficult is you've got it where, um, you know, uh, uh, People are looking for uh, a better option. They're looking for a better system. So a lot of times they're going to switch and they're going to use something like this. They use a variable output programmable thermostat uh, because uh, they can see the effectiveness of it. Um, these are so, it's just nice. I, I, there's ones where it'll actually track and tell you uh, for the air conditioning, how many kilowatts per hour it's consuming. For the heating mode, how many kilowatts and how much gas is it consuming? So you can actually know before the gas company, it's going to give you an estimated, oh, we think we burned this much gas, this, this many cubic feet of gas. You look at your last gas bill, you can already calculate it before the bill comes in. You know, um, That's the idea and the advantage of it. And plus, if you're checking that on a regular basis, because nowadays it's no longer just left on those thermostats, that information because it's microprocessor, because it's connected to Wi-Fi, you can bet where it's going to be. Smartphone. Every smartphone. Uh, just about nowadays, every company has got, as far as major thermostat and manufacturing companies, they've got a, an app. Um, Nest is one of the most popular ones. I hate Nest, uh, personal opinions. Um, but Nest thermostats, they were developed originally by people who worked for Apple to make apps for the iPhone. And they designed this new smart thermostat. Um, the problem with it is it's not a true variable output programmable thermostat. It is a programmable thermostat, but that's it. Um, the variable output is what allows for the system to be modulating. That's what makes the difference. That's what's going to actually make it where it's not just feeding information to heat or cool. Um, it's going to be heat or cool this amount based on not just the information of inside the building, but also outside of the building, what's the temperature and everything. So um, these are pretty interesting devices that we use a lot of times, um, but they cost buku bucks. I mean, uh, I think, oh gosh, it used to be $1,000 for some of these thermostats. Um, some of them still are $1,000, depending on how fancy they get. Uh, like I said, some of them looks like a fancy graphing calculator, which is not that fancy. It's really pixely and looks kind of okay. Uh, and then there's other ones nowadays, especially where, because they just keep getting nicer and nicer. Um, one of the videos I sent you all out uh, tonight is for a Lennox iComfort. Uh, Lennox iComfort is gorgeous. It looks like an iPad. It's literally a thermostat, but it looks like an iPad mounted on the wall. Um, and it's got all these options and settings and controls for zones and temperatures and oh, I want to put it in vacation mode and I want to have it preset for certain seasons and I want to have it where it's set for, you know, if I leave my house at this time or, you know, if, uh, I mean, it, it goes beyond uh, what it used to be for a thermostat. It used to be cool when a thermostat had it where you could set, you know, um, the, the four times a day when you, wake, when you wake, when you leave, when you return, and when you sleep. That was considered crazy. Now it's, you set those four plus, uh, you know, it can adjust to what's the outside temperature, what kind of weather are we expecting, um, and you can put in, you know, hey, I want it, if, if the heat has to kick on, I need it at least this temperature, if the AC has to kick on, I need it to keep it at least this temperature, you know, so your house would never be more than, you know, let's say between 74 and 68 or something like that. You could set it where, hey, heat, kick on 68, AC, kick on if it gets above 74. Um, and that way you've got it where you've got that level of control uh, with the system. But with these new HVAC systems, especially with these new modulating gas furnaces, uh, they've got a lot of extra controls, uh, a lot more that they can do uh, with that information, and it makes them just more energy efficient. Uh, 
fossil fuels and natural gas uh, are not cheap. Uh, it's, it's, it's an expensive thing to burn. So if we can have it where we can take a furnace that was burning, uh, you know, and 25% of its emissions uh, were going straight outside and were not used for heating, uh, you know, that kind of sucks. And, but if we're going to take that same furnace and instead go from 25% of the heat going outside to 3% of the heat going outside, that's like 90% savings. Because that, that's what you were wasting. You were wasting 90% of that heating gas, and now you're going to save 90% of it. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really interesting, and it, it's, it's what's going to make a difference in the future for these systems and what's, what's going to make it so that they can last. Because um, one of the big questions is, you know, if we run out of natural gas, we run out of these natural resources, what's going to happen to natural gas furnaces? What are we going to use as a heating medium? So we're trying to pinch, off, uh, pinch on to every penny, uh, every little, you know, cubic foot of gas that we've got left right now that we can use because in the meantime, we're going to have to figure something else out in the future. That's way down the road, but for right now, gas furnaces, they're going to be one of your most popular forms of heating uh, here in Virginia, especially. Um, we use heat pumps a lot. Uh, but gas furnaces are used uh, just as often, uh, especially when you get to uh, more uh, urbanized areas like the city of Richmond, when you get to uh, closer to DC and Alexandria, uh, Arlington, uh, all that kind of stuff. But when you go to like the boonies out in the countryside, that's when you're gonna see more heat pumps. Um, the only time I've seen uh, gas furnaces in the country is usually it's gonna be not a natural gas, but a propane uh, gas tank, gas uh, furnace. Um, the reason for this is just because natural gas has to run through natural gas pipelines um, and, uh, and, and you know, that's expensive to install. So, uh, you know, the only guy I know I've ever known that got around that was when I was growing up as a kid uh, down in Norfolk. Uh, there was a dude who worked for the gas company. He was a neighbor of my parents. He told everyone in the neighborhood, hey, sign this petition saying you guys want natural gas to piped into the neighborhood. And he told them when they come back around, you just say, nah, I've changed my mind. Um, and they'll be fine with it. And that's what he told everyone. So the company got all the signatures. They said, yep, we're going to start putting it in. They got the gas lines, started doing the construction, getting right to the front of the neighborhood. Then they start going around the neighborhood saying, okay, who wants to hook up for the utilities? Not that many people. Very, very, very few uh, as far as I know, it really was just our neighbor. That was the only guy that ended up getting gas to his house because he wanted gas for his heating and gas for his cooking. That's, that was his whole thing. Um, yeah, so it's not, it, yeah, it's not a conventional thermostat. That's the whole thing. Uh, when it's talking about variable output, it's not going to be, so old school thermostat, it's on, it's off. Turn the heat on, turn the heat off. Uh, these are, eh, turn the heat on 20%. Turn the heat on 40%. Turn the heat on 60, 50, 100, you know. Uh, it will tell it uh, how to turn on the speed. The weird thing about these thermostats more than anything is you're not going to see your standard R, W, Y, G. It's not going to be like that. It's usually going to be R, C for R, for R for your power, C for your common, for your 24 volts, and then you're going to see 1, 2. And the 1, 2 is your data. That's all that carries. One and two carry data from the thermostat, and then you're going to have a one-two connection from your indoor unit, from the thermostat to the indoor unit, and from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit. That's your typical way that you're going to see these things. Um, so it's really interesting how those ones work. Uh, it's really just a matter of checking for the voltage and then making sure that the, uh, usually on the thermostat, it'll have it where it'll give you um, a status section where you can check and see, okay, what's the status of my Wi-Fi connection, but also what's the status of my communication between my thermostat and my, my units as far as the uh, furnace and the uh, condenser outside. All right. Um, again, fuzzy logic. What it's talking about is the processor. Um, we're not, it's, it's, it's algorithms and codes and all sorts of stuff like that to try and anticipate uh, how much heating it's going to need. Uh, when it has a memory bank, is when it can be more uh, solidified in that logic. It can actually remember what happened the last time when that kind of a heat load happened or um, when that weather uh, came around the same time, how the, how the house reacted, what level of heat it had to produce for it. 
Um, so that's that, that's when it gets really cool with a lot of these new ones. But um, again, load factor is used to determine when or how long the furnace should be activated. So the load is just how cold is it? Um, so, you know, how cold is it in, outside versus how warm do you want it inside, you know? Uh, if, uh, if it's a 50 degree day outside and I want 80 degrees, that's a 30 degree load I'm putting on my furnace. Uh, so it's going to have to be kicking on pretty regularly at a high temperature. Um, so this is what you're going to see a lot of times for, uh, your, uh, variable speed systems is just, it's going to have a load factor that'll be able to adjust it. But, uh, that's pretty much it for tonight. Um, remember two stage furnaces going to be controlled by uh, some sort of IFC, typically, um, a, a control board, uh, just a very, very basic one, while modulating controls, variable output, output thermostats is when you're getting to the much fancier, higher-end control boards where it's going to be a larger control board, typically, uh, but it'll definitely be always a more expensive one. So uh, that's it for that. Again, I sent out those other videos. I'm going to go ahead and upload this one and uh, have that ready for y'all for the uh, rest of the evening. All right. Mm -hmm.